God, we want to overflow you into everyone that we are around. And God, as we open your word today, we are simply praying, what does it look like for me to imitate you? Help us to see that and understand it in a way in which we can grasp and take hold of today. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. If you are a parent in the room, you probably understand the words being an imitator of someone, right? Because you have these little humans in your life that actually imitate you, right? I don't know if you've ever seen, maybe it's your neighbor, uh, they're, they're push mowing their yard, and then right behind them is a little boy or girl with their plastic push mower and pushing right behind mom or dad, and, and that's being an imitator, right? In my household, we have a, a, a six-year-old and a two-year-old year old and the two year old is a little girl named Shelby and Shelby loves to imitate her mom. Anytime her mom goes to put on makeup, Shelby runs down the hall and says, me, makeup, me, makeup. <laughs> and it's not because she likes makeup or even understands what it does to her face. It simply is that she's imitating or mimicking her mother, right? Those are both really cute and precious examples, uh, but there are some that are not so precious, right? Sometimes you see yourself and your kids in a way in which you deeply regret. Uh, I remember the first time that I put Theo behind the wheel of my car, uh, and he started imitating what he thought it looked like to drive, uh, because he's seen that in me. And I was very embarrassed. <laughs> right? He started jerking the wheel every way and pointing fingers, and I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Yeah, then you start imitating or start doing something different, so you imitate something different. Or maybe it's the, the kid that you've seen with the fake cigarette. I don't know if y'all remember those, but <laughs> back in the day, some of those kids were too good at the fake cigarettes, right? They had some kind of person to look up to to figure out what it looks like to smoke a cigarette. And then what Paul says to you and I as, his, as believers, and if you're a believer in this room, he says this. Just like a natural child follows their father and mimics them, so it is with those that are beloved children of God, right? And you are to be an imitator of God. His grace in your life then places a calling on you to be like him. Now, I want to say this before we keep going. If you are not a believer in this room and you've come here just to get some questions answered or even experience church for the first time, I want to say that. I'm personally glad you're here. My name is Justin. Um, but the primary purpose of this passage and for this sermon is for those who call themselves Christians. Yes, will these words help your life be better? I think so. But they won't matter if you don't follow Jesus. Okay? So I want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. If I seem like something, seems like something I say is pretty harsh, it's because it's written to Christians, not you if you're not a follower. Okay? Verse 2. These are where he starts getting practical with how you and I walk in the way of imitating Christ uh, and being like him. He says three things in Ephesians chapter 5 that help us figure it out what it look like to imitate God. The first is in verse 2. And he says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice of God. The first thing that he says for us to walk in is to walk in love. Everybody say, walk in love. There we go. So there's the one first practical thing that we, we start off. And he tags right along with Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. And this is what it says there. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. See, I think there's a current tragedy in the world and specifically in the Christian circle and in our CCC family where you and I, when we come to the table and someone has hurt us or disagreed with us, our reaction is described more by bitterness and anger than it is by love. In fact, I sat across the table just this week from a fellow co-worker in Christ who's a minister, and they said, I'm just bitter with the church. And it broke my heart because, see, I see that to be the exact opposite of what love is. That when someone hurts us, when we become bitter in anger, we decide we have to defend our own position, our own rights, and our own desires, right? That, that you and I step into the situation knowing the other person's the problem.
And then Paul says this. He says, your bitterness and your anger comes out in two ways. He says, walk in love first, right? And then he says, here's two ways that you don't walk in love and that you can answer the question. Am I walking in love? So if, if, if you're answering these questions in a way in which doesn't honor God, then you're probably not walking in love. Verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Did you see it? I don't know if you saw it. It's kind of, it's difficult to see. He says, the way you treat people, right? How you treat people directly defines how you love, right? Um, and so we have an epidemic in our world of not loving because of the way that we treat people. In fact, just look at one of the worst problems in the American culture is something called pornography. And if you don't know what pornography is, I'm sorry that I'm introducing you to it today, but pornography is an epidemic in our country where, where men and women look and treat other people on the internet as if they're an object to be possessed for their own desires, and it's not just a problem in the world, right? If you looked at the most recent Barna survey, it said that 54% of American men who claim to be born-again Christians at least watch porn once a month. Directly in opposition of a way in love, right? Do you see how the, it's the opposite? It's how you treat someone. You treat someone as if they're there for your own pleasure, your own rights, and our society is riddled with major issues with the way that we treat people. And then he says the other opposition to love is in verse 4. He said, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So the first is when you know you're treating people the wrong way, you're not loving. The second is the way that you speak to people, right? Right? The way that you and I talk and interact with people, no matter who they are, whether they've heard us, whether they've not heard us, whether we've never met them or they're our best friend, the way that we talk is a direct indicator about how we love someone else. In fact, Jesus agrees with Paul on both of these points. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, he says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so the, the question with this first one is simply, am I full of love? Is love what overflows from me and from my heart? And then Paul got real practical with us, right? Did you see it there at the last part of verse 4? And he said, let there be thanksgiving, right? If you want to directly speak and act in a way in which is in accordance with love and walk in love, you do it through the word thanksgiving. Uh, in fact, uh, I can guarantee you that if in any situation where you want to be bitter or angry, if you come into that situation with first thanksgiving in your heart and thanksgiving on your lips towards that other person, it changes the situation, doesn't it? I can guarantee you that if you come into my office and you have an issue with something I have said or done, if you start the conversation and I start the conversation with being thankful for each other, then the direction of the conversation would be totally different. And so I want to practice it this morning. I don't want to be just a church that says this is what we do. I want to practice, okay? And so I want you to think about your neighbor, and I want you to think specifically about something you are thankful for in your neighbor, okay? So think about it. And maybe you don't know your neighbor, and if you don't, that's okay. Uh, you can say, I'm just thankful that you're here at church and that you're part and, and, and here worshiping God today. And so I want to put it into practice, being thankful. Ready? So tell your neighbor in three seconds. One, two, three, go. Can I tell you, friends, others will listen to Jesus when you and I speak with words of thanksgiving. Others will see that we don't speak in a normal way, right? In a normal society, when, when you and I or someone else hurts someone, what do we do? We just cancel them, get rid of them. Are you living in a different way? 
Every opportunity that you and I have as people and followers of Jesus to be bitter and angry is also an opportunity for the gospel through thanksgiving. Put it into practice this week. Ephesians 5 verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance with the kingdom of God. You know, I think that you and I are supposed to be built differently in the way that we function. And so part of why I said, you know, if you're not a follower of Jesus in this room, that I wanted to cl clarify that I believe that Jesus is actually who gives me personally the ability to be built differently in these situations, right? In fact, if you look at verse 2, that's what Paul says in verse 2. Look at the very end of verse 2. He says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice of God. That, that I can't by myself, uh, you know, I always want to defend who I am, but then when I have a life built on the foundation of Christ, then that love that he gave me then changes the way that I love other people. And so I just want to look at Jesus for just one second uh, as we talk about what does it look like for him to be a fragrant sacrifice. I love those words. Those words come from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is essentially before Jesus, how people relate to God. And so before Jesus, how people related to God, and one of the things God asked people to do was to make sacrifices of animals. And when I say sacrifices, I don't mean like... Uh, Oh, generic, you can have my dog. No, like he asked them to kill their livestock for the forgiveness of their sins, right? He said, you sin, and I want you to see the, the severity and the, and the problem with your own sin and, and what sin actually results in physically. I want you to see it and put your eyes on it, smell it, and know what it looks like. And so an animal needs to die when you sin. Right, and it says in Leviticus chapter one, and it says it's when they when they sacrifice the animal and then put it on the altar to burn it, that it's a fragrant offering, it's an aroma pleasing to God, which is just mind boggling to me. Right, Cindy has decided this year that she wants to go kill a deer, uh, haven't you? Uh, Cindy's my wife; she's right here on the front row, and uh, she has never killed a deer and has decided this year she wants to go do that and, and get some meat for the family. And I am trying to convince her that she doesn't actually want to go do that. Um, and so if anyone in the room is a hunter and you want to take Cindy with you, um, I'm going to give you a warning real quick, okay? When it comes time to dress the deer out in the field and, like, take its organs out, she's probably going to pass out, so just beware. Uh, <laughs> And then you go back to this idea of the sacrifice and like, that's what they did. It says to take the innards out, clean them, and then burn them before God. When Jesus was a sacrifice, it wasn't some kind of pleasurable event. It wasn't something fun to be around. It was an event in which they tried to erase him from humanity. Philippians chapter 2 says, Jesus being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of a man, he humbled himself even to death. Death on a cross. And God exalted his name above every name. That Every knee would bow at the name of Jesus and confess Jesus is Lord. See, this sacrifice that Jesus makes then gives you and I uh, the opportunity to live like him, right? Before he comes, all the time, if I were to sin, what I have to do is go to a temple in a singular place and sacrifice an animal for my sin. And what he says and does is he takes all the sin of the world on the cross, he dies, is buried, but then the beauty of what Jesus does is he's resurrected to new life. And these aren't just words that I'm saying that I've said a thousand times. These are things that I believe in and have put my trust in. And that at his name, every knee will bow and, can, and every tongue confess. 
And so continuing to think of living like Jesus, here's the second thing that Paul tells us. It's in uh, chapter 5. We're going to start reading in verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. And so I want to say this as we read this part of uh, Ephesians chapter 5. There is no perfect church in the world, right? If you came here thinking you're going to find a perfect church, let me just uh, tell you now that this church is not perfect, right? And even the, in, in Ephesus, that church was not a perfect church. Somehow, some theologies and philosophies had come in and infiltrated themselves in the church, and then the body of Christ was then being deceived in a way in which to follow them. Now, Paul doesn't specifically mention in Ephesians what that philosophy or theology was, and so we won't talk about it because I don't know uh, to take a leap, but I do know the result of that philosophy or theology. It's in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. This is a letter that's written from Jesus to the church, right? And he writes a letter to seven churches, and the first church is to Ephesus. And here's what he says about them. He says, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Honestly, those are probably some of the scariest words in the Bible for believers. See, because what he says is they've lost their first love of the grace of Jesus Christ that works in their life through the Holy Spirit and the building of the body of believers. They've lost that love and fallen back to an old pattern. Now, I won't speak for your old pattern, but I think all of us that are Christians have old patterns in our life that sometimes we fall back to, don't we? Uh, for these believers, some of them were Jews, and for them, the pattern that they fell back to was a bunch of rules, like I have to, I have to read my Bible, I have to go to church, I have to take communion, I have to give money. <laughs> And that was the pattern they fell back into. For some of them, they were Greeks before they became uh, Christians. And their pattern was, I party every night and every day. I do whatever is permissible inside of this body. I do what I want. And that was the pattern that they had fallen back to. And Paul tells them this. He says, walk in a way of love. And here's the second one. Verse 8, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So the first is to walk in love. The second is to walk in what? Everybody say it together. Light, walk in light. Now, uh, my household, I told you I have a six and a two-year-old, uh, and I have a picture up here of what we've already done in our household. We have put up our Christmas tree. Uh, so I want to see in the room, does, is, is anybody like a hardcore, you can't put your Christmas tree up until Thanksgiving? Anybody that kind of person? Repent. Uh, the kingdom is near. Jesus still loves you. <laughs> Our family loves to put up our Christmas tree. We usually put it up on the first Saturday of November. We were three days late and didn't get it up till election day, but it's up already. And our household is stirring like crazy about Christmas. Every single morning with Shelby Jean, you can hear the little patter of her feet coming down the hall. And you know what she says? Almost every single day, she says, Christmas is coming. <laughs> Christmas is coming. She has no context for what that word actually means. She doesn't remember last year's Christmas. She doesn't know when it's coming, but she's excited about what's to come. And I actually agree with her. I think that it's going to be an amazing Christmas and that we're going to have a great time as a family and we're going to enjoy that time and celebrate it. And so I want to ask you a question. Have you lost your excitement for being the light of the world? If you are a follower of Jesus in this room, he gives you the ability and the responsibility to be a light in the dark world. You once weren't just living in darkness. He said you once were darkness yourself, but now you are a child of light. So be the light of the world. 
Every time Shelby sees Christmas lights, there's three or four that are in the neighborhood, and she says, Christmas is coming, and she's even transitioned from any light, like just street lights. She's excited to see him and says, Christmas is coming. <laughs> what is Christmas? It's a celebration of the gift of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, you and I need to be excited about the opportunities that God gives us and the places that he puts us where we can be the light of the world. He says, first, walk in love, but second, walk in, in light. You know, here at CCC, we believe that December is an amazing opportunity for people that are far from God. December is a chance where people uh, from all walks of life will actually come to church. Did you know that? Uh, I would challenge you just to invite someone during December, and I would almost guarantee you most of them, their answer will be yes. Because they want to experience what's all the excitement about. They live in a culture that tells them that Jesus is the reason why we're celebrating. And so they want to come to a church. They want to be a part of a body. And they want to see what does it look like. And so in December this month or this year, we're going to be very practical in the way that we teach and ask and answer questions uh, that are very practical, but also very basic. Uh, questions like, does God really love me? Or why is God letting this happen to me? Can I trust God? And so we want to also be very intentional about the way that we steward our time and invite people to come and be a part of the body of Christ. Uh, and so I just want to challenge you. That's one of the direct challenges is being the light of the world is going out as the body of believers during the season of Christmas and being excited and say, hey, I want you to know who Jesus is. Jesus is the gift that comes at Christmas. And now we're going to skip some verses. And if that really bothers you, it bothers me too. But uh, we, we need to get out of here on time. Uh, you can ignore me. If it bothers you so much that you want to ignore me and read the rest of the chapter yourself, good for you. Uh, verse 15, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most use of the time because the days are evil. He says there's three things that, that you and I, if we're going to be imitators of God, one, love, two, being the light, three, being wise. What does it look like for you and I to be wise and to look carefully into our own lives and the way that we're spending the precious time that we have? It's actually just looking in and being honest. Most of us, if we're believers in this room, that we think that we can fool ourselves, right? <laughs> I can pretend like I'm actually loving and being the light and walking in wisdom. But if you take a careful look at your own life and be honest, how would you answer these questions? And here's the questions I want you to wrestle with this week, okay? So if you're taking notes or if you're not taking notes, write these down, okay? Put them in your phone. Here's three questions I want you to wrestle with this week. Am I in my actions in words, being an imitator of Christ? Am I in my actions and my words being an imitator of Christ? Two, am I excited about the opportunities God's given me to be the light? Am I excited about the opportunities God's given me to be the light? And three, how am I spending my time? Every single person in this room, I promise you this, you could fool me because I'm just oblivious to the world most of the time. You could probably give me the, the Christian answer to all those questions, and you could fool me, and I'd say, yeah, you, you are doing those things. But you will never fool the God of the universe, who one day, if you've never submitted to him, you will bow down to and confess him as Lord. So the very practical part of this if you're a believer in this room, is to go and be the light of the world in the, in the place that God's planted you, right? Go invite someone. Go, go say, hey, would you want to read the Bible with me? <laughs> Most people actually want to know what the Bible says. Uh, help them learn what it looks like to be like Jesus. Go be the light of the world. Second, for the person in this room, that you've heard me say all this and you're like, 
yeah, but Jesus. <laughs> like, like, I struggle because I look at the church and I see how the church is imperfect and I struggle with Jesus because of that. If you're in this room because of that, I want you to, I want you to hear me say this. Jesus wants to be your Lord and Savior, right? You know, so many times we get hung up on what everyone else is doing in the world and we, we look at everyone else, but Jesus wants to be yours, your Lord and Savior. And he died on the cross to purchase that right in your life.